Senya Kondratevya, you're joining us as a Russian journalist who's here to cover the summit. What are the expectations the Russians have from it? Does Russia feel isolated now in this new world order that's emerging, particularly post-Ukraine? Well, uh, you would see the uh, Russian officials, uh, including a Russian foreign minister today in ASEAN summit. Uh, you just Google and you, the photos that are coming, uh, he's surrounded by, um, you know, the world leaders. Uh, I, I don't really buy that argument that Russia is isolated, ex especially post um, you know, Ukraine conflict, uh, uh, Russia has a very difficult, if at all, relationship is left with the West, but is the West uh, the world? Uh, I think Russia has made it pretty clear that it doesn't con consider the West as the, any, you know, majority in the world. Okay, they may be influential economically, but uh, I think Russia is quite open to cooperating with its partners um, in Asia, in Africa. We just had a African, uh, Russia-Africa summit in St. Petersburg, my home city, and it was a no, tremendous but how, how invested, uh, show how, up. Of, no, for um, that very reason, I'm sorry, how invested is Russia in G20? If you're creating alternate blocks, including BRICS, other blocks across the world, is Russia invested in a block where the Americans are seen to play a major role? Is Russia willing to invest its equity in such a block like G20, in your view? See, you are right saying that uh, G20 was set up as a block uh, under the influence of um, US, but you see the G20 today, uh, you see the kind of discussions are taking place. Uh, we, I think, uh, and that's why India is actually playing a major role and we should uh, uh, just laud India for whatever it's doing uh, during its presidency because it's clear to everyone that there, has, there are cracks for G20 and maybe these cracks are for good. That is something we mm -hmm. are um, yet to see. But whatever India has done in within its presidency mm -hmm. uh, is just showing that um, the 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 uh, the fact that there is no consensus because uh, you are saying that <laughs> Russia, China, you know, uh, uh, trying to block the resolution, but uh, Russia and China probably see the other way around, right? Okay. Um, so I think that next in G20, I think G20 is changing itself and the world is changing itself. The number of uh, times that we heard uh, words like, uh, you know, multipolarity, multilateralism from uh, Russian, Chinese or Indian officials, uh, we, we hear these words every day. And this is not something that has been happening uh, two, three or five years back. Okay, so, so I think you should see uh, G20 evolving. Okay, you're saying the G20 is evolving in a way that it is no longer America-centric, certainly. Is it Europe-centric? Matthew Drawing, you know, the flip side, as was just mentioned by my senior uh, Russian guest, is that we are looking at China and Russia's potential spoilers. The flip side would be, is the Western world willing to do more? Will, is it willing to accommodate concerns that the Global South, which uh, the Prime Minister of India now wants to champion, Mr. Modi wants to champion, on issues like climate change, on issues like providing greater economic equality on these issues? Is the Western world willing to do more to reach out? Or do you believe that Russia and China alone must be seen almost as the villains of the peace? I think the answer is yes, and I think from the onset, the G20 uh, has been created to build bridges between the West and uh, the rest of the of the world, and I think uh, the that the most Western capitals are uh, happier with uh, dealing with the G20 than dealing with the BRICS, for instance, in the formats uh, from which they are uh, not present. And I think it's also fair that uh, the G20. Is also representative of uh, of new balances in the world order. You mentioned uh, economy. China represents, uh, according to the IMF, 25, uh, 35 percent of uh, world economic growth. India is 15 percent, and Americas uh, are only 14 percent. So I think uh, this is this is an important venue even for Western uh, capitals. And I think they are pretty happy and comfortable with India. Uh, taking the lead because India is part of the of the quad 
security dialogue in the Indo-Pacific, uh, from my uh, home country, France, has very strong ties with India. And I think they really see India as a bridge uh, with uh, with uh, the so-called uh, global south to work on issues, critical issues. We we talked a lot about Ukraine, but mm -hmm. uh, climate change, um, uh, new new governance for uh, international finance. Uh, these are very critical issues, and I think the the West is uh, is really comfortable with the G20 as the main venue to tackle these. Uh, you know, let's turn therefore to that question, which comes from what was just mentioned about the role that India has to play. How has Prime Minister Modi's leadership shaped G20? That's the second question we want to pose here. Meera Shankar, you know, there's a lot of hype. India is projecting itself as a Vishwa Guru. Critics will say this has come by, by pure rotation, the presidency. Prime Minister Modi wants to see himself as a leader of the Global South. There's a push for the African Union to be made a member. Uh, do you see what's happened in the last 12 months in a way giving India uh, a leadership position within the G20 or is that a bit of a stretch to say simply because by rotation we've got the presidency we can actually claim that we are driving the G20 forward well we have got the presidency as a result of rotation uh, but India has taken its uh, pres you know presidency quite seriously and has sought to shape an agenda going forward. So irrespective of whether we get full consensus or not on a range of issues, uh, I think we should be able to move the needle forward on some of them. And these are issues which require multidimensional action over several years. These are not issues which are going to be solved overnight. But we have put forward fairly substantial proposals on the table, easy ones to take decisions on membership of the African Union, uh, rescheduling debt where China is a holdout, it doesn't want to join a common platform for mm -hmm. rescheduling debt of the developing countries, um, expanding the mandate of the multilateral funding agencies, the World Bank, IMF and others, to include global public goods. Now, that should be easy enough for people to agree on. Recapitalizing the banks may take more time, for instance, to reach a consensus on. Similarly, the issue of climate finance may take more time to reach a consensus on, but say, for instance, recapitalizing the banks. Mm -hmm. There's a report which India had commissioned, done by Larry Summers and N.K. Singh, which talks of how the banks could be recapitalized, having recourse to the market, but also expanding concessional lending for the least developed countries. Mm -hmm. So those are ideas which are going to be on the table, and I would hope that they shape the agenda going forward. For instance, in the health sector, mm -hmm. I think there's an agreement that WHO will try to create a digital platform which will integrate all the digital platforms that were set up at a national level to deal with COVID. So that would be a great uh, help mm -hmm. to countries because all information would be available at one place and uh, it would be easy to follow also what other countries are doing. So this is another area where progress seems to have been made. Well but all of this depends on getting a final consensus on the joint statement or consensus on an outcome document which sets out the areas mm -hmm. where uh, countries have agreed to take follow-up action.